I'd be willing to wager you're a lot like me, if you watch this channel at least. You rack your brain daily, and you wonder about the vast amounts of time that have come before humanity, and then look at animals from the time period and think to yourself, what did dinosaurs even do during like the 150 million years that they had? They walked around and screamed. Glad to see not much has changed between them and us. In the 1940s, a terrible event would happen. Granted, around this time frame, many terrible events were happening, but this one would take place on the west coast. A small family having recently just moved there would get absolutely wrecked by something unseen to us. Us, but we will come to laugh at it later. Not the family getting wrecked, but the things that actually were wrecking people. Fast forward to around 30 years, and the survivor of the attack would learn of his homestead that his family once owned. Returning back in a more gestated form, he would in turn bring his own family into the feeding zone, not really knowing of the dangers that lurked just below their feet. Coming into contact with these beasts, it was assumed to be a raccoon because those are usually about six feet tall and have no hair, as we all know. During these interactions with these beasts, we would begin to see their potential origins and why they have evolved to not only be man-eaters, but also their physiological characteristics that have adapted them into a new variant of life previously undiscovered by man. But how exactly did this happen, and what would their origins be? Well, that's a great question, bro, so let's discuss the proposed evolutionary pathway of the cave-dwelling creatures in the tank, and enjoy everything before the inevitable copyright ends up taking down this and obliterating the video from orbit. <laughs> So we kick off our story with the understanding that if anything is attacking your home, you are required to go goblin mode on it. And I'm talking like full tactical gear running through the woods, full on chimp energy. It's some good stuff. A family is asleep in full clothing, as one does, as the old man then heads outside to descend into the underground terror dome in the middle of a thunderstorm. Climbing down, it's a worse version of the backrooms down there, and it seems to go horribly wrong as we can hear him yelling because clearly there's something down there. As the old saying goes, it takes a wonderful brain and exquisite senses to produce a few stupid ideas and this was one of them. We now move on to the place with the real monsters, California. I am required to dunk on the west coast as I reside in the east coast and because of who California kind of is as a person. I don't make the rules, I just am here to enforce them. Now that a large section of my audience has clicked off this video, it's Oakland, California and to be exact it's in 1978. We get some interesting music choices, not something I would pick, they do know that Led Zeppelin was big during this time, right? We then meet Jules, holding an eastern water dragon, who can get up to four feet in length if you didn't know. This family runs a pet store, which I mean, this place is pretty poppin' for a random pet store in the 70s in California, different era I suppose. A youngling runs up asking if they can go. The mother assumes it to be an anti-nuclear march, which, uh, I mean, I guess it could go either way. The hippies did rob us of the nuclear age, and we have a lot of problems now because well, they didn't like it, and these would have been solved. Like, seriously, nuclear energy has got quite literally the worst PR team on the planet. I'd live next to a properly constructed nuclear plant over all this crap we're putting into the air currently. Or is it about nuclear capabilities? Which, fun fact, or supposedly fun fact, because I don't work directly with nuclear warheads, because of our nuke-for-nuke nuke pact with, like, the rest of the planet and kind of how we didn't want to blow ourselves up, supposedly if we fired off every nuclear warhead we have currently, we would only destroy a small percentage of the planet. And Enough to really only disrupt world trade for a few weeks because we simply do not have what we had 50 years ago. Which would have been around this time frame, so uh, yeah, I guess that all works out. Now this was just an informational thing I saw. We could be holding out and hiding a lot more nukes and other countries could be doing the same thing. So. Uh, go team, I guess. Anyhow, no, she's here to save the trees Lorax style, potentially even speak for the trees, and this being the uh, early 70s, or at least the early 70s being over, they have stopped speaking Vietnamese in US history. So now we meet Ben, the father who lived. He helps run the pet store, and apparently things are not going so well. Who would have guessed running a pet store in California wasn't viable without like 39 other side gigs? As they talk about their financial troubles, Rhea then calls out to her mom, telling her that Reggie ate his brother. He's an axolotl. You see, he's an amphibian now, now, and will be for the rest of his life, but if you put him on land, he will grow legs from the nubs and walk on land and eat everything in sight. Could this be foreshadowing? Only one way to find out. Be there. But before we do, we need to set the stage for why axolotls are quite interesting. It's a biology channel after all. Axolotls are kind of an intriguing species because they appear to be a readaption, which is actually seen in other animals on this planet. The theory of evolution states that because the sun was a deadly laser, there was nothing on the surface of this rock for quite some time, forcing animals 
animals to remain in the oceans as crustaceans and fish. It's more complicated than that, but that's a general picture. Over time, as the fish would move towards the surface because of the ozone layer forming, the fins would then turn into limbs supporting the animal. This would result in amphibians. Amphibians are rather unique in that they are a midpoint between reptiles and fish. They require their skin to be moist in order to breathe and are quite susceptible to chemical changes in their environment. This would require them to stay mostly wet in order to survive, which had them keeping near water. Now, there are varying degrees of this requirement with some amphibians able to leave the water for longer periods of time, and some needed to be in a moist environment more regularly. The axolotl is a type of amphibian that seems to have taken return to monkey meme to its next logical conclusion, return to fish. As stated, it has been seen in other animals before previously as well. The evolution of whales took a similar pathway, having evolved from four-legged, even-toed ungulate animals, meaning that whales' ancestors got up on land and said, nah, this ain't it, and then went back to the ocean. Even still, we see these mammalian characteristics shine through, but the point is adaptation can take an animal and begin changing it in surprising ways, even just taking it back to where it was, which we will find out just how surprising it's about to get. So Ben closes the shop up at like 2 p.m., I wonder why they're having money troubles, as a man comes in asking for Ben. He's a lawyer, and his partner in a firm had a stroke a while back, and he's been tasked kind of going through the files and getting everything squared away, which, uh, it's now time for some more ADHD tangents because I can cram in my EMT training into a video. Remember to identify a stroke, it's balance, eyes, face, arms, speech, and time, or be fast. Deviations and normal responses indicate a stroke. A good way to tell is have a person put out their arms, palms up, and then have them close their eyes. If one arm then drifts down, run, don't walk to the emergency room, or better yet, just call 911, uh, because then it's like a mobile emergency room. Coming across a file for Ben's mother, it shows that she held a sizable parcel of land on the Oregon coast. Coast. This is perplexing to Ben as he was never told about this. So it's out to the Shire. It's out to Hobbit's Bay they go. What a name. He's handed a key and told that, well, you know, some families have secrets and apparently yours does. And it's true. The secret in my family is when I was a youngling, somehow my Halloween candy kept getting eaten and always going missing, yet nobody apparently took it. Very strange. He then asks if Ben was aware of what happened to his father. Ben is under the impression that his father and sister met their end in a car accident, but in reality, they were eaten by cave monsters. Or maybe cause of death is actually just drowning. Supposedly. Whichever. Heading to the coast, I have to tell you, I drove from Georgia to Seattle one time, and I was unimpressed by about 80% of Oregon. It's not their fault, it just doesn't look all mountainy like that throughout, which was quite immersion-breaking. Although the coast does look like that due to the mountain range. Anyhow, as they pull up to an overgrown area of the road, we must remember this is Oregon who receives up to 90 inches of rain a year, so that road would absolutely be overgrown by trees, yet it isn't. Someone has been clearing it, which is not at all important to the story. Thanks for listening. Also, at this point, we are only a mere seven years away from the greatest movie ever made on this planet, The Goonies. Luckily, they must have been further up the coast because they did not run into these things, which we we're going to have to be talking about today. Otherwise, that would have been a completely different movie from the original. Also, that is absolutely a cherry beauty. I'm getting way off topic. Not usually a fan of wagons, but uh, it's pretty nice. Heading into the Jurassic Park territory, they are forced to walk coming to the end of the road. The dad gets out, and I only just now realize I wear 70s clothing for some reason. As they emerge from the tree line, Jules asks if it has power. I'm gonna go with a no on that one. But look how overgrown the house is with foliage, right? I guarantee you the road would have been straight up forced at this point. So then old Papa Ben breaks into the house, which I'm sure is just inundated with black mold and with the subsequent spores destroying their lungs at this point. This seems like this guy would have been kind of more apt to have made a day trip out of it to confirm yeah i'm gonna go check out this crapshoot of a house you guys stay here and run the shop since our money troubles are you know in trouble and if it's horrible i'll just sleep in my car and i'll be back in a few days now it's uh let's set up the house conjuring style and stay on this condemned property i don't understand this at all entering the home i can only imagine it smells like the inside of a mothball in your grandmother's closet as jules opens the back door at least it has a nice view hashtag goals my wife and i actually want to get a house on the west coast i mean we can't afford it but hey a man can dream opening up the water tank in the ground ben immediately decides you know it'd be a cool idea to check out what's down there can't say i'd do the same it's just a water tank i would not be doing that but he doesn't even have a flashlight so he just descends and starts looking around Walk Walking around down there is more spacious than you might think. Also encased in the dirt, he discovers the ancient remnants of a lantern. Rust in your drinking water is peak health. Making a few trips back to the car, they get this uh, house set up, I guess you could say. 
As they then walk around the grandparents' room and they find old pictures and attempt to open a nailed shut window, which when I moved into my house, all the basement windows were nailed shut as well. Still have no idea why that was the case. In doing so, we pan out to discover, ooh, claw marks on the windows. The raccoons are at it again. Thus begins the process of cleaning up the house for some reason. I mean, I suppose to figure out if they want to live there or maybe they just want to sell the house or in general just clean it up. I don't know. Anyhow, Jules ends up finding some documents about the family like newspaper clippings, insurance claims, the checkbook to an account that has been appreciating with boomer era interest on these accounts. Actually, now they didn't find that last thing. It would have helped, but they do find that Ben's mother was questioned about the missing dad and offspring. They then hear a smacking noise and don't investigate it as the dad misses the perfect opportunity to tell Rhea sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. I'm serious about those bed bugs. This house for sure has insects. I'd wager 70% of the structural support of the house is termite based. We then get a creeping dolly shot of the outside of the house. Thanks for the information on that, John Tron. And Jules reads Rhea a story as the dad cleans up some dishes, but outside, the dolly shot now creeps away. And we hear some deep growling in the woods. Heading upstairs, Jules and Ben talk about how Jules found his mother's diary. She has apparently gone somewhat insane by the events and had to be taken into one of those famous ethical 1940s institutions. How she kept her frontal lobe intact is beyond me. And why is that, I can hear you asking? Well, Papa Roanoke always has the lore. Around the 40s, there was a complete lack of information on how the brain worked, and also the general care of those deemed afflicted with mental issues and how they should be treated. It's actually somewhat of a dark era. Well, there was one treatment in particular that would make people more docile. A lobotomy, also referred to as a prefrontal leucotomy, would be a medical procedure that would come out of the 1880s to some success that would be used as a therapeutic measure to help grossly disturbed patients suffering from some form of mental illness such as schizophrenia, manic depression, or mania. Now remember, grossly disturbed. By severing the neural connection running from the frontal lobe, which oddly enough is where the emotional control centers of the brain are located. Look at Phineas Gage when he had a pike go through his head, which severed his frontal lobe from the rest of his brain. He lost control of his emotions, but there are some that say he regained some of those functions later on due to neuroplasticity. But anyways, this procedure was first meant as a last resort. However, as time would go on, one man in particular would go on to begin regularly performing them for literally any reason. American neurologists Walter Freeman and James Watts would alter the lobotomy, electing to use tools to isolate the prefrontal cortex. Despite objections and heavy criticism from American neurosurgeons, he would perform this barbaric surgery in sometimes as little as 10 minutes. As you can see, I don't really agree with lobotomies. What a stunning and brave stance, I know. Prescribing the radical procedure for things that didn't require them at all, many people would essentially have themselves ripped away from their meat suits if they exhibited anything less than agreeable traits. You could literally get lobotomized for arguing if you disagreed. It was insane. Seems like over time, this may have become something more likened to a threat to be used on people under the guise of treatment, though that's really kind of more anecdotal than anything, so you can't really log that away as information. It's just kind of how it appears. This procedure would lead to several issues such as apathy, passivity, lack of initiative, poor ability to concentrate, and in general, a decreased response to life we know it. During the 40s, these things were being administered to many during this time frame, with Freeman performing over 3,500 in the 60s alone. Talking about more prefrontal cortexes run through than a middle school hallway. Finally, medications were created, which means no more severing of the frontal lobe, but while technically successful, it serves as a cautionary tale that not everything that fixes a supposed issue is worth the long-term price the individual has to endure. Man, what a time frame. All right. Anyways, let me climb down off this soapbox and get back to it. Jules asked what Ben wants to do with the house because it's creepy AF. They then read the diary and get some flashbacks about how things were super neato for the family and how the tank was installed. They drilled over 100 feet down and now the water was sweeter and more nourishing than she had ever tasted. Is spring water really sweet? I have no idea. Usually it tastes pretty gross to me. However, later in the entries, they start getting anonymous packages trying to unsettle the family, which is never really explain as to why. So fast forward later as the dad then climbs into the water tank in the middle of a storm on that Sigma male grind set, Ben's mother realized, well, he was nowhere to be found the next day. I mean, it was the 40s, so maybe people just sort of like left and did their own thing back then. But I know if I went missing in the middle of the night, probably within an hour or so, my wife would be up looking. So the cops then arrive, but aren't very helpful. Rosie then disappears May 10th. So at this point, 
Ben is upset that he was never told any of this. And rather than wanting to figure out what happened, as clearly this is a pretty strange set of circumstances, Ben isn't even, like, curious about what happened. <laughs> okay, bro. Meanwhile, down in the water tank, we can still hear growling noises. It's amazing how far we are into this episode, and we still haven't seen these things. But that's about to change, don't worry. Later in the night, as Rhea attempts to sleep in the house, she hears scratching noises as her door opens. She decides to not really worry about any of that, and instead looks under her bed, finding something is just below the carpet trying to get through. Running upstairs and jump scaring her mom, which is a classic, she says something is trying to get into the house, which then the mom can hear as well. She wakes up Ben as they all head downstairs in this creepy house, like, why are you staying here? Good lord. Walking through, he doesn't really see anything of note, but can hear something moving around, and then finds that the back door is open. Yes, that is when you leave immediately. You do not pass go, you do not collect 200 doll hairs, you get your family, take a nice stroll out to the Buick outside, and you leave. Because at minimum, that means someone is actively walking through your house, and could still be waiting inside, making you think that they had left, but in reality, they're just waiting for you to go to sleep. So he does a smart thing, and decides to go outside, and leaves Jules and his youngling inside of the house, on their own, very good, heading outside herself, also leaving the offspring inside, she is following something growling with no counter to it, and no help. 600 IQ play. But then she gets jump scared by Ben. So despite the door of the house being open, they just decide to go back to sleep. Okay. So uh, they didn't shut the door and uh, nothing else can happen, right? You're good to go. Also, Jules at this point is having clairvoyant levels of dreams. California psychics, am I right? She has downstairs and I can see that the makers of this movie were definitely going for the conjuring vibe with the juxtaposition of the music and the creepiness. Also, fun fact, the family from the conjuring lived just up the road from my college when I was going to school. And also another fun fact, I don't know if you guys remember uh, uh, Little Nos X. I actually went to school with them. Uh, something about Carrollton, Georgia makes you really want to do something with your life and not return to Carrollton, Georgia. Whether it be demonic spirits or making music or even YouTube videos like yours truly. So as Jules looks outside, Rhea is playing with the dog and Ben is working on a water pump because of course he's a handyman as well. Fixing, dragging his family out to a rundown house, dead parents. Is there anything this man can't do? The triple threat. Heading back downstairs into the water tank again, his wife does the smart thing and asks him, you know, why don't we just call someone to fix it? But he is convinced it's just a stuck valve. Based on nothing, of course. I don't know where he would have gotten training on fixing a water tank, but hey, it's just me. I don't know why any of this is going on, to be honest. With you. But following it back under the house, he then goes to open the valve and ends up bleeding in the family's water supply after cutting his hand on a rusty valve. And that's going to require a tetanus shot, which we haven't talked about diseases in a moment, so I require it of myself in videos. Tetanus itself is an infection, as you know, that is caused by the bacteria Clostridium tetani, which is interesting because it hails from the same family as Clostridium difficile. And look at that! If it isn't the cousin Clostridium botulinum, or just our old pal botulism, this disease will absolutely destroy your meat suit, but but what's worse is in a lot of ways, like Clostridium difficile, for instance, they're actually very difficult to kill. Being resistant to many antibiotics, it's also able to stand up to many hospital-grade disinfectants, and it's becoming an issue in hospitals. Not tetanus, but difficile. Back to tetanus. Affectionately known as lockjaw, once you have contracted tetanus, it can be fatal for a person. There are many paintings and renditions over the course of history of soldiers in particular contracting tetanus, and it's not just their jaws that lock up, but their entire bodies. Sudden involuntary muscle spasms in the stomach, as well as painful muscle stiffness, is quite common and eventually the onset of seizures will begin along with it kind of affecting your heart rate. Your muscles may actually contract with such force that it can snap your bone causing fractures all over the body. Located in soils and manure it can actually be found on rusty equipment as well. Being that it is a disease of the central nervous system it can have far-reaching implications caused by the toxin producing bacteria which it's always interesting to me that we use Clostridium botulinum for its toxic effects in the treatment of things like sagging skin and more recently in the treatment of chronic migraines. The entire family appears to be based on producing toxins and can have varying effects on the body. But the main thing to remember is that we have vaccines specifically designed to deal with tetanus that will last around 10 years before you need a booster. The thing to also remember is there is no cure for tetanus once you have it. Basically, you're brought into the hospital where you have to wait for the disease to run its course. So I guess grabbing the lantern out of there wasn't really that bad of a move, but it's still very clearly going to have like a layer of soil or silt on the ground, housing all that bacteria. All in all, I would not drink that. Moving on. He then somehow drops his flashlight back into the literal cave system that is under the house. Shining his light, he can't see anything and decides to go, yeah, yeah, no, and then leaves the area, but not before poking something with his flashlight. Going into the kitchen, they now have water, but as mentioned, it's pretty gross and contains all that sweet, sweet, delicious bottom of his shoe bacteria as well as what was already in there, including the leftover juices for the thing that he literally just found. 
He then mentions the spring water, which Jewel says they should bottle it. It could be a new thing. And that's a great way for Nestle to take all of your water, which interestingly enough, they are causing literal water shortages by bottling too much of it and selling it across the world, which is confusing times that we live in. So Ben at this point brings up what he found in the tank. Jules knows it's amphibious, it has nose, gills, teeth, and no eyes, and this suggests it is completely subterranean, or at least mostly. It appears to be a new form of animal which Jules is highly interested in. So let's talk about what he found because it is rather curious about why that was there. Clearly this is some form of offspring that didn't survive. Getting a look at his body, which is difficult in some respects because it doesn't really show it that long, we can clearly see it to be a cave-dwelling species due to its lack of eyes. Now there are different levels of cave-dwelling animals. The first level is your troglazines, which will visit caves but not continue to live there for their entire lives. Possessing functional eyes, typically these animals may start out in caves or move into caves, but they're not going to just completely hang out there forever. Humans might be a good example because back in our more primitive days we used caves as shelter, but our real destiny was out on the surface and potentially even amongst the stars one day as long as we don't blow ourselves up like a bunch of dumb apes. Remains to be seen. The second level are troglophiles who spend a lot of time in cave systems but have been known to go on the surface as well. They prefer the cave system and may exit it to look for food, dragging animals back to the cave to be consumed. Beetles, worms, frogs, salamanders, crickets, and crayfish fall into this category usually, which is highly interesting to specifically this movie. The oddest ones are the troglobites. These creatures will exist solely in the cave system their entire life. Straddling the line between no nutrition and just barely hanging on, these animals are living their lives on nightmare mode as the cave systems are not tremendous ecosystems with a lot of options. Because of this, their physical appearances will change. They have very little pigmentation and may have poorly developed or absent eyes, which is interesting because if the eyes are poorly developed, this does imply that they were a surface animal and have just decided to say screw it and return to cave. Have I used that joke already? Probably. They will also have longer legs and antenna to help them navigate to find food. Outside, the quadruped keeps barking at the tank as Rhea yells out to her dad into the tank, but nobody answers because he decided to just not, you know, hang out in a creepy dark tank system connected to a cave mouth. As she does this, she spots something extra creepy. She says something is in there as her parents come out and have a right proper domestic over who left the top of the tank open. But as they do, someone has literally entered their home because the front door was open, which is a bold move. But I guess everything is just opening doors at this point, so why not? I mean, at minimum, I would think it's like a ghost or something with all these doors just moving by themselves. Hmm. The person who arrived is a realtor telling them that the property they have is actually massive. Several private coves and islands all belong to them. Okay, so advice time with Papa Roanoke. You didn't ask, but I'm gonna tell you. If you ever come across this amount of land on the coast with this much space, never go with the first offer. If you have to sit on it for a few years, you hold on to that like your life depends on it because good lord, that is some serious cash. Luckily for me, my family is only leaving me debt, so uh, I won't have to make those decisions. Unless, of course, there's some dark backstory to my family where we actually owned like a Popeyes or something, but then we were attacked by cave monsters and the old man was a soul. I don't know. Anyway, this is a stupid comparison. Uh, I don't have cool history like that waiting to be uncovered, but some of you might actually have that and some of you might get inheritance and whatnot, so just keep an eye on that. The family was able to get the land because apparently it was cursed. So maybe the land isn't worth that much. The native people that thought the land was cursed then noped out of there and the locals now think the land is cursed and didn't want people there. Which they could have just told the family, hey, this land isn't very good. I mean, it seems like a problem also that'll solve itself sooner rather than later. So why send them packages? Who knows? The realtor says that they can actually raise the price if they'd like and Ben's like, no, no, we don't need to raise the price. Shut up, dude. Jules actually has some brains and says, yeah, raise the price. Like, of course, raise the price. Why would you not? Realtor is a master negotiator. Usually you, you keep that. I mean, I guess maybe she's getting paid commission, so it would be in her best interest. Anyways, Realtor now leaves in the evening and then heads back to her car, which for reasons unknown, she parked at the literal top of this long driveway rather than following it down to the path, which would have been easy. I, hmm, maybe she's trying to get her steps in. Also, not sure what type of car this is, but it looks pretty nice. Firing it up, she then backs up and then gets stuck immediately and then something is watching her. But as she gets out to check what she's even stuck on, she gets grabbed by something and dragged off into the foliage to her doom. Jules then wakes up and hears something as she wakes up Ben. Once again, I have to ask, why are you still there? You already got the offer. You could have literally just made phone calls at this point. Jules then heads downstairs alone to check it out. But as she does, she spots something in the window. It moves away too quickly as Ben comes down and says, well, I can't see anything now, so obviously there was nothing there. It must have been a raccoon. You just contradicted yourself within two sentences, but okay. Anyways, he's like, all right, we'll call the realtor tomorrow and we'll sell it. So it's now tomorrow, and instead of calling the realtor 
and selling it and leaving. He keeps trying to fix stuff. Dude, stop. You are about to sell the land. There's no need to keep trying to fix up this condemned house. So he decides to head back into the water tank, which is now chest high water. My man, what? <laughs> All of this. He's doing this for coffee. You are literally leaving today. Why would you do this? You know what? Take your coffee cup. Go ahead and just scoop up some water because that's like pretty much the water coming out anyways. But he does this because the plot demands it. Well, it smells horrible down there and he goes to get the pipe unclogged and he finds some jewelry and something is clearly in there with him, but he can't figure out what it is. Vinny Boy wins the Lack of Self-Preservation Award. Exiting out of the chest high water, he emerges suspiciously dry as he brings a dead raccoon out of the water and still fully intends on drinking the dead raccoon water when he heads inside. Darwinism. I'm sorry, but Ben is just completely on a fast track towards some incurable disease and getting attacked by a monster and bleeding out. I think we know which is probably more probable. It's the incurable disease. Handing Jules the jewelry with his unwashed dead raccoon hand, it matches his sister Rosie's necklace, which is probably a little alarming. Jules says they need to call the police as Ben says he'll go to the gas station. We then get a flashback of the grandmother nailing the windows shut. The mother then puts Ray to bed at what I can only imagine is like 4 p.m. before Jules spots that the water tank is open once again. Driving to the gas station, Ben finds that the realtor's car is still out there. She didn't make it very far. Following it back, or at least the blood trail, he then finds a blurry shape on the ground. It's the realtor, because I can't show you anything fun. Spooky! Running back to the car, he gets on the radio, which is hilarious, as he calls out, but surprisingly, nobody answers. I remember watching this thinking, well, I mean, obviously he's going for the 45, and it's a walkie-talkie. Jules then walks downstairs and finds water on the ground. Following it back, it goes to a locked door. Again, the back door is open. These things are like clever girl levels of understanding doors. Finding the keys, she then heads into the back room and finds more of a diary. As it details the things attacking the house, this alarms her maybe just a little bit. And this is why all the windows were boarded up. Also, the door shuts for some reason, locking Jules in there as she hears growling in the house. But, okay, hold up. Let's talk about that for a second. The doors are opening and closing by themselves, completely unrelated to the actual creatures. If my math is right, and it's probably not, this is like the fifth or sixth time that a door has just been opened even though it was locked or closed with no explanation. I don't know if the movie itself is trying to reference that these things can close close and open doors or pick locks, or if the house is just straight up haunted, but it is never explained. Maybe the foundation of the house is just totally shot and the floors are flexing, causing the walls to move and shut doors. Either way, well again, no, that wouldn't affect locked doors keeping them open or allowing them to open them. There's honestly no telling. So dear old dad returns back to the house as Jules eats it running into the house due to, you know, the water on the ground, and Ben runs inside and locks the door, which will have absolutely no effect on anything and it will probably be back open in like 2.9 seconds. Yelling out to Jules, Ben and tells her the realtor is donezo and they won't be getting that promised offer. Arguably even worse than the monsters attacking your home. Jules then tells Ben that things took out his family according to the diary. Well, that's what you get for coming to this creepy house and dragging your family here. So they then start packing up their crap, which leave that behind. It's just a few pieces of clothing and you still own the land. You can come back with like a better counter to these things. Sell it from a distance. <sighs> Anyways, Ben goes outside to meet the officer, which this is where things start getting hilarious. Hearing growling in the woods, right? Something is very clearly watching the officer approach. He turns off his cruiser and gets out because he hears something too before returning back to his car. So, all right, you can't tell how long this is, but the creature comes up to the window, right? Seconds are passing and he already notices it. It slowly crawls into the cruiser and doesn't know that he's there as it can't see him as he slowly just goes to like get his uh, handheld off of his hip, but he gets attacked. This man's reaction time is otherworldly levels of slow. Like a case could be made, well, he was in shock, but if that thing is coming up to your window and you have an answer to it right there, I think that might take precedence, you know? So the thing attacks and we get a look at it. It's a much weaker version of a death angel from a quiet place IMO and uh beautifully those videos have got copyright hit love it anyways like for real it, it, the inspiration is uncanny but the question now is what did this thing come from and why does it look this way so the first thing we must establish is what sort of creature is this well to begin with these creatures clearly hail from a cave system below the house when the water source was dug, this required them to likely blast and drill through the ground, which connected a nearby cave system. It would appear as though these creatures are rather large, which means the cave system itself could be several things. In general, because of the propensity to prefer water, seeing as that's how they move, it's likely a combination cave system. Having both large bodies of water, which would actually be more feasible than you might imagine, given the amount of rain that turns into groundwater, because they have limbs, there must also be sections of cave system that are dry underground. 
Much like the axolotl who has legs that will form when the creature moves on to dry land to hunt, this species has elongated arms, which much like the troglobites we discussed earlier, would form due to living in the cave system. Now what's interesting is a form of deep sea gigantism may actually apply to this animal. Because the cave system would have colder waters, just like the creatures at the bottom of the ocean in total darkness in frigid waters are larger in order to retain a more efficient metabolism, so too would these creatures kind of have them lead to a larger size, and in a lot of ways you can actually compare cave systems to the bottom of the ocean. It's cold, it's dark, nutrition is rare, and as such animals have evolved to be more aggressive with prey as you never know when your next chance to eat is going to come. Continuing on with this line of thought, we see that the tank monsters have dark pigmented skin and a lack of eyes. While the eyes would be comparable to the creatures of the deep along with the creatures of the cave, the pigmentation is interesting as typically in caves animals will lack pigmentation, but in the deep sea creatures may be pigmented black. This is clearly a hunting adaptation for for the tank monster. Because of their dark pigmentation and their ability to exist in both land and water environments, this would suggest that they're actually ambush predators, which as they sense humans when hunting, is supported by their propensity to hang back and observe in the cover of the forest rather than to immediately run at their prey. The darker pigmentation of the skin would help to further hide their bodies in the darkness, which is interesting because this may suggest in some ways they are not completely troglobites, but are actually more cave dependent forms of troglophiles. The reasoning behind this is because in the area referred to as the land of the cursed, if these things were contained only to the cave, they would not have enough interactions with humans to the point that humans would recognize them as a threat. Along with this, the creatures themselves would not be able to effectively hunt on the surface and understand to use trees as cover. Their nocturnal hunting patterns also suggest they understand that the sun can damage their skin and dry them out, which will, you know, not go well, but this is not at a conscious level, but from an owl that burns level. So sort of like uh, an animal touching an electric fence, it doesn't understand electricity, it just understands that hurts. This would indicate that while most of their time is spent in caves, which has brought on evolutionary changes in the body, they will still hunt on the surface, which has made them a recognizable threat to the locals, even if they are mostly just old stories. This indicates that just like in the Goonies, there may be some cove with a cave opening that connects these creatures where they may hunt the cold waters off the coast or just offshore even going inland sometimes to find prey within the tree line. Opening up the tank system just gave them another entry point to land further inland and up on the mountains. With these patterns established, the next question is, what even are these things? I think the biggest clue as to their species was given at the beginning, the axolotl. Shocking revelation. These things are clearly salamanders who have adapted to living in a mostly cave-like environment, which is represented in several ways. First, salamanders have teeth, if you didn't know. And not only do they have teeth, but in their larval stage, they will possess conical teeth, which is represented in the creature that Ben found early on. As a salamander ages, these teeth will be moved into different positions so they can properly grab prey and hold on. Salamander skin is also going to look exactly like the creature that is in the tank. This smooth skin <laughs> needs to remain moist to breathe, and that is the epitome of the salamander, that the only thing missing though are the eyes, but considering salamanders are highly adapted to their environments, it's unsurprising that these creatures would maybe lose their eyes as it's a waste of energy and resources for the body. Plus, we have no idea how long ago this transition to cave dwelling began. But I can hear you now. All right, Roanoke, that's all well and good, but these things are friggin' massive. Surely, living in a cave would not allow for such things, even with the idea of deep-sea gigantism. And you're right, for the most part, it would be difficult. But it depends on what sort of salamander we are talking about here. There is a salamander known as the Chinese giant salamander, and it is absolutely as described. It's giant. This salamander's only two predators are humans and other giant salamanders because they can weigh up to 130 pounds or 58.97 kilograms, and this is about the max, but typically this weight puts them around 55 to 66 pounds. Their usual length is about 3.8 feet, but the largest one that they have found was close to six feet long. I think it was like five feet, nine inches. Uh, humans do the same thing with our height, right? Yeah, like yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much six feet. When you take into account that you can start to see salamanders get much larger than you might think, it kind of lets you know, hmm, maybe this uh, moved from somewhere else. But how would it have gotten there? It's clear that the Chinese giant salamander is an outlier from standard salamanders sizing, but this might actually give us a clue as to how they got to this cave. Roughly between the time frame of 36,000 years ago and 19,000 years ago existed a land bridge between Russia and Alaska due to more water being locked in glaciers. Now, while it was cold, it is hypothesized that this newly uncovered landmass, rivers and streams may have actually run, which is where humans would also walk across from Asia to North America, along 
along with many other types of animals. When this happened, because of the propensity of the giant salamander to live in cold mountain streams, there may have been streams that eventually connected via freshwater when the glacier started melting, giving a short time period that an exploratory migration may have taken place. With these salamanders, following the same pathway many other animals were taking, they would end up on the new landmass. They would then end up in North America along with small bands of tribes that settled the West Coast. These interactions between the descendants of these two groups, as the salamanders changed into cave-dwelling creatures and humans having to deal with cave-dwelling creatures, would kind of give them a reputation of the land must be cursed. These creatures are descendants of the giant salamander, in my mind, no question due to their size and morphological presentation, because they do also have the same skin. This time frame would also have given them enough time to maybe adapt to the cave environment on the Pacific Northwest while growing larger due to their environment and hunting patterns. But let's wrap up the summary as well. So Ben arrives to find Officer Quick Hands getting dragged off as he heroically runs the other direction. Heroically locking the door behind him, he heroically hyperventilates and decides that they should heroically hide. They then talk about what this is and he decides that despite this thing being out there, he wants to go back into the water tank and blow it up with fertilizer. This is one of the more dumb plans I've heard, but hey, let's see what happens. What's the, what are the kids saying on TikTok? Let this man cook or some, anyways, it's not cool anymore because I said it. Gathering up the materials in the shed, he then sees blood on top of the tank and goes down there himself, which is very smart. Also, the water is still like chest height. Dude, okay, I know I've been complaining about this, but just gather your family, move quietly through the woods and get out of there and then come back with like other people or an actual counter to these things. But alas, he does not. Walking through the water, he's probably thinking at this point, uh, it may have just been easier to put a rock over the entrance of the tank. Also, Officer Speedy draws down there as well, and he's not looking too good. Turning off the water, well, there's a creature over there, looking at him menacingly, and then goes under the water out of sight as another one has entered the house. But oh, it's a fake out. It was actually just a dog running into the door. But there is one in there, so just give it a second. Meanwhile, back in the Cave of Wonders, the dad then crawls into the cave opening to detonate the counter as, of course, his flashlight runs out. Using his lighter, he gets the fuse line lit as he starts to very slowly crawl out of there. He ends up blowing it up while he's still in there, which is uh, going to activate the almonds of the creatures as he gets attacked. Watching the rave in the tank, Jules then runs out to go help, but now one is outside the door as well. Reyes screams like a nerd, alerting the thing that they are actually in there as Ben continues to get totally wrecked in the tank. Back in the house, Jules tries to keep the thing out as Rhea gets grabbed by a literal dude in a black suit, it looks hilarious, and then pulled outside as it doesn't immediately eat her, which is very strange. Also, these things appear to have like hair-like protrusions on their back, I'm pretty sure. Why is this? Now, I don't think it's actually hair. I believe at one point you might be able to see what looks like hair on these things, but what it's most likely going to be are sensory protrusions. Think of it like whiskers, except made out of skin. It's clear they hunt by compressional sound waves, either in the air or in the water. Likely hunting in the water is more effective as they can feel it more readily, but these protrusions may be like sensory growth, that show them where the compressional waves are coming from. And also it's possible that in the water, they just kind of fan out. And if something floats by, it allows them to know something is passing them because it touches these things. An interesting adaptation for hunting in complete darkness in lieu of having eyes. Dad now crawls out of the tank as the other one tries to eat Jules, using its thrusty to yell at her, look me in the eye and tell me, A, these things aren't completely cursed and B, that meme doesn't apply here. So anyways, Ben then lays there like a huge nerd while his offspring gets pulled into the tank. Oh, excuse me, he heroically lays there. So Jules has to go down there with her Clorox arms to disrupt the breathing of these things. Lighting a torch and grabbing a pitchfork peasant style, as she moves through, she begins calling out to Rhea. Something then jumps into the water with her, and we all know what it is, it's just not shown. And somehow, Rhea is still alive. Like, she's the first. Also, quick question, if these things do drag their hunts back to the cave, why did it not drag the realtor back? I'm assuming it was maybe a distance issue, or even a skill issue of the salamander. Seeing this thing's head out of the water, it's clear they are hunting her as she dilutes the Clorox down to non-lethal levels. Very smart. So she pretty much immediately then gets grabbed as she starts stabbing the water and getting bitten. Ouchies. She's able to stab it as another one launches its attack, but she's able to pitchfork it through the face as well, ending that salamander's whole career. And also luckily for her, her craptacular torch is now going out. Moving deeper into the cave opening, Rhea is back there underneath the house stilts. Grabbing Rhea, the things are just beyond the veil of darkness. Jules then tells Rhea to stop being a nerd and just crawl through the freaking cave opening before flame broiling the amphibians because she is taking way too long. But that runs out pretty quickly as Jules nopes out of there as well, heading to the surface. The things are starting to give chase, but they're able to get out of there before getting monched on. Taking the dog and Ray into the car, she doesn't have the keys, so unfortunately she's gonna have to go back for old Benny boy. Heading inside, well, he's still 
still alive, that's apropos, but what isn't apropos is the creature now opening the tank lid. As Ray and Archie hang out in the car, these things kind of apparently can climb trees, it appears. They begin to surround the car, which if they are hunting by sound and smell, how they are able to find her in the car is a little strange. I mean, I suppose possibly by her scent, but even then, had she kept quiet, it's likely these things wouldn't have known the difference between glass and metal of like a car and a literal rock, which means they probably wouldn't have wasted their time trying to break in, which means she was pretty much 100% safe car. But this is a movie, so she does the smart thing and then runs outside of the car. As a thing just literally sits there and screams at the ground, I have no idea what they were going for here. Like, watch it. It doesn't try to attack. It just sort of rees at the fact that something is faster than it. So with literally no pep in its step, it finally turns around and then begins slowly crawling up the back of the car before taking a round through the, I already used the joke earlier, but just through its throat. Having survived, Jules stops the car to have a nice cry as dad continues to bleed out in the back of the car as they decide to never have amphibians in the pet store again. Ah, the end. Or is it? The date is June 22nd, 1993, after the credits. We are wiser, we have hard hats, and our style of clothing has changed. As the construction group is planning on building a neighborhood, the creature's jimmies are rustled once more, except now they have to deal with hungover construction workers with access to hammers. It's probably not gonna go well for them. And thus concludes, or does it? The date is May 19th, 4509. Oregon's now just a straight up crater, leaving only the amphibian death angels. All in all, I don't wanna be this guy, but as long as the salamander is just choosing to scream at the ground, I fully believe I could take at least like two or three of these things in a fist fight. Give me a bottle of Clorox to douse my arms with, and I could take on the whole cave system due to that being like filling your lungs with Clorox by comparison, so it's probably gonna bug these things. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, leaving a like 100% does help this video get out there so it can get nuked from orbit by copyright. And subscribing is a great way to let me know that you enjoyed the content. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link where last week we talked about a youngling that went missing and he apparently followed his grandmother into a cave system in Mount Shasta who later he described by him it turned out to be a robot. Yeah, weird things going on in Mount Shasta. It's based on a true story too. Anyways, I'd like to thank my patrons real quick as well. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Desk Dancer, holding it down. Thank you, sir. I'd also like to thank our scientists as well, Chad W., Lacune, Logan Satomi, and Tyson Nakanishi. Thank you guys. And to the rest of my patrons, I appreciate your guys' continued support on this channel. With all the crap going on concerning South Korean companies illegally copy like just copyright striking, not claiming my stuff, it's been quite a good time. But having your support has decreased the panic mode, so thank you. All right, well, that's gonna do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.